Hey, welcome to the Trapital Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Runcy. Today's guest is someone I've been wanting to talk to for a while. He is the editor in chief at DJ Booth, the VP of Content Operations and Audio Sur Artist Services at Audio Mac. And I think he's one of the best people to follow on Twitter. We got Brian Z. Zisuk on the podcast. Welcome, man. Dan, thank you so much. And uh, you pronounced my last name correctly, which no one ever does, which is why I shortened it to Z on purpose to save people the pain of having to potentially mispronounce it. So you did your research. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny. I saw an interview you had done with someone else that had butchered it and then you corrected them. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to be that guy. Let me try and get this thing down. I'm surprised you even tried it because most often people are just like, I'm not even going to take that risk. Let me just rock with Z. But uh, yeah, you, you nailed it. 10 out of 10. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, I recently saw that you had posted on Twitter that DJ Booth, which I think is one of the hip hop blogs and websites that keeps it real, recently celebrated its 18th anniversary, which is quite an accomplishment because I think a lot of your peers back then have not necessarily lived on and you've seen so many evolutions. I'm looking through the screenshots of that and so much of it is bringing me back to this like GeoCities era of blogs and all of those things. But you've clearly seen so many evolutions of just websites and blogs, but also the music industry and how hip hop media itself, what has it been like having a site that has lived on and obviously knowing that it needs to transform, but you're also following all of these other trends that are happening. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that only now can I possibly look back on and, and, and be able to articulate exactly the, the path that we've been on and, and almost get nostalgic about it. You know, when, when we first started and I met uh, my business partner, Dave Mackley, on the internet, by the way, I sent him a cold email. That's how we first were introduced. Uh, there were no expectations, right? Most people start businesses with the intention of generating a profit. This was a hobby. This was something that we both enjoyed. Uh, we love music. We love DJ culture. We love hip hop. And so for us, this was let's have fun. And over time, it, it just, it developed into something that obviously we, we were working toward actively, but we didn't set out to do initially. Uh, and so with that came less expectations. We never went to a bank and took out a loan that we had to you know, pay back, which is something that you typically would do. And then that sort of dictates the decisions that you make because everything is then shaped around. I have to pay this money back to the bank. We have to make these decisions that will specifically help us do that. We were always operating from a position of just invest money back into the company and grow it. Um, the height of the blog era was the best time I have ever had professionally. Um, it was the wild, wild west. We were able to help artists break. We were able to um, host mixtapes. We were able to sponsor events at South by Southwest, uh, A3C, CMJ. We were able to work with artists at the infancy stages of their career pre-streaming era. And it was, it was just, I can't even put into words how exciting that was to feel like a, just a small little piece of, of their success was due to the support and coverage that we showed them. Uh, you know, now 18 years later, uh, I'm just glad we still have the lights on, to be candid with you. Uh, like you said, so many of our peers have uh, chosen to let their, their platforms, their blogs die out or just due to circumstance that was the, the natural evolution. I'm, I'm happy that people recognize that we are a platform that has always believed in artist discovery and artist development and artist education. And that we are a platform that has never subscribed to celebrity news or gossip or rumors or any of the tabloid bullshit that so many others felt like they had to go down that road to stay in business. I appreciate that part of it too. Because yeah, on that note, some of your peers, it will be the first thing you'll see like, okay, what did Offset tweet about Cardi B or what does this put us on Instagram? And don't get me wrong, I understand the attraction of that. But I think 
you clearly have a much more clear and defined audience because you didn't do that. You know that you are working on a discovery that's been the brand. So regardless of how this culture and how we've seen different eras of streaming and all that, you've been core on that. And I really like that. Thank you, Dan. You know, don't get me wrong. There have been articles that we've published over the years where in, in, in retrospect, I wish we hadn't published them because I feel like they did walk the line of let, let's let's try to drum up enough conversation to draw in page views. And that was that was not a great feeling. It, whenever we published something and it, it was with the intention of creating conversation, it was very important to me that that was never done uh, without being uh, morally responsible for covering the artists who were highlighted in those stories in a thoughtful and considerate way. Um, and I told people all along, if we ever got to the point where the only way to keep the business running was to change course and run stories like you, you jokingly alluded to, you know, essentially covering tweets about celebrity news, that I, I would much rather just walk away uh, and, and be done than, than go down that path. Right. And I think the, the admirable piece of it is that I'm sure it had its tough moments and points where you probably felt like, okay, like, is it getting close to that point? Because you think about the ad model and just the revenue model for a media company, you put an, your, com your competitors put out those types of articles because they get the clicks. And obviously you're trying to sell ads, sell impressions. But on the other side, if you have an audience that is passionate and they don't want to get that stuff, people monetize often through paid memberships and stuff like that. But you're not serving, you know, this like tech audience that has, you know, tons of disposable income. These are artists that are putting themselves out there and taking risks. So you're not going to be and you don't want to charge for that information. You're trying to educate in the same way. So I'm sure it had tough moments from there, but I'm glad that you're able to persevere through that. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, it, it's been tough for the past five, six years. It's been it's been brutally tough, um, you know, for at the height of our popularity in terms of page view generation, we were hitting somewhere between six and eight million page views a month. And that was incredible. And as journalistic landscape started to change, as the model started to change, as as the digital ad became weaker, as as Facebook sort of got themselves involved, wherein they Trojan horsed every publication who had built up a loyal following and then just pulled the rug out from underneath all of us and said, hey, you know, this, this incredibly loyal hundreds of thousands of fans who have opted into following you in which you disseminate your content to through our platform, if you want to reach any of them, you're now going to have to pay us for it. And it was a model that didn't work because the money that you'd be spending to boost the content, you'd never even make back even on the revenue generation from the page views. So you had to almost view it as a loss leader to just try to get people into your orbit. And hopefully they like the content enough that whenever they see it next time they come back. But there's very little loyalty to publications in the era of social media. You go on Twitter and Instagram, and you just keep scrolling until you see something that you'd like. Um, no one books Mark websites anymore and, and visits them every morning. So we had to counteract this, this drastic behavioral change that also weakened revenue significantly. Even if you were still doing millions of page views a month, you weren't able to monetize them in the same way. Um, and, and so I'm really happy with where we're at now. We have this wonderful partnership with my other company, Audio Mac, um, wherein we have strategically aligned our, our editorial team. The team that we had at DJ Booth moved, moved over to Audio Mac last September in full. Um, and what we're doing with Audio Mac World and DJ Booth's support now has allowed us to get content out to a wider audience. Um, serve that audience with the, the best um, discovery and educational content, stay true to our journalistic mission uh, of never, you know, uh, uh, trying to grab it low hanging fruit. And so I'm really pleased with where we're at. And like I said before, I'm just glad that 18 years later, we're still able to publish content. God's honest truth. 
Right, right. I hear that. And I think the alignment between the two companies makes a lot of sense. I know I talked about this as well. We had Dave Mackley on the podcast, uh, co-founder as well of Audio Mac a few months back. And he, and the same thing you're saying too, I think the reason that the sync works so well together is that content clearly can be a great lead generation for your other services. So you have this, it's now part of Audio Mac world. You're trying to attract a certain type of audience to Audio Mac. And I think that space, there's still been so many players that are reaching for whether it's an independent artist or someone that is rising, trying to come up, you have a number of different companies there some of them you've become partners with and it's become dope to kind of see that through i feel like the past few months in the news press it's been boom 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 audio mac as a partnership with DistroKid. you are able to get on billboard so the partnerships are cool too to see yeah they're exciting and and it's it's all the result of of the the branding and the mission which has always been staying true to artist discovery. You know, we are a, a rare flower, I believe, in a, a garden full of, uh, I'm struggling to come up with the proper garden metaphor because I didn't plan accordingly, but we, we are one of the lone uh, platforms, I believe, that has truly continued despite signing major label music licensing deals to stay true to our discovery mission. And so when people come to Audio Mac, they expect to see artists they have never heard before highlighted in the same space, op occupying the same real estate as a household name. And, you know, for the most part, streaming behavior is, is done passively. When people log into their uh, music streaming app of choice, they click play on a playlist. And then they do one of two things. They either stick their phone in their pocket and they resume the activity that they're, they were doing, or they navigate over to an, a social media platform and they're listening in the background while they're doing something else. And so we have prioritized discovery content. We have a lean forward uh, user base who actively seeks out new artists and new titles. And Incorporating world into the, the Audio Mac infrastructure is, is key to this mission because it fundamentally changes the user behavior. By having written editorial in the same space as music streaming, you now lean forward into discovery. You're able to contextualize the artists that you find on playlists. And instead of sticking your phone back in your pocket or leaving, you're reading content while you're listening all in the same um, session. And so, you know, these companies that we're doing deals with, they recognize we're doing things differently. And I'm, I'm happy to see that they're excited to be a part of what we're doing. Right. Because I think where some of the other companies have struggled, they clearly understand that there is an editorial connection between what you're writing and what people are listening to. But they've tried things with video and they've tried things with other things. And I think that video, as we know in general, just because of the media landscape, can be a very tough thing to nail down and have integrated naturally. But text just makes a lot more sense. And if you think about how valuable and impactful the blog era was, yes, it was there, but it was still very independent. But I think it worked well because it was like, boom, here's the source to find the latest thing. And here's a direct link to whatever that thing is, whether it's a link on the DatPiff, you can click it here. Like it, it, it worked well from that perspective. And I think even though you're not replicating that, there was still a user and a consumer behavior from that, that I think was still relevant that taps in, not just in general, but to the type of person that would be a audio Mac listener. I, Dan, I agree. I mean, the, the issue when, as it pertains to reading editorial content in 2021, it's not that people don't have an appetite for it. It's that the idea of, and this sounds crazy to say out loud, clicking a link and leaving social media and navigating to your mobile web browser is more work than a lot of people want to do. And so it's not that they don't want to read. It's that it's just inconvenient enough. And so by taking the editorial and putting it in the same space as the streaming service without having to toggle back and forth between two applications. Um, we're, we're, we're taking that, that hurdle that, that there is the perception of that users have and eliminating it. And so we're really excited about it. I believe that the incorporation of, of 
editorial and social into the streaming space is what will encompass version 2.0 of the streaming era. We're still in version 1.0. For as large as streaming is, we're not anywhere near uh, reaching its apex. There are hundreds of millions of people who have still not adapted to a streaming service. Uh, and so, yeah, the future is bright, I believe. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that's a really great point about us still being in phase 1.0 for all the reasons you mentioned. And the other part, so many of these streaming services have yet to become profitable or sustainable on their own. I think we need to see what that looks like. I'm not as much concerned about, you know, the Amazons or the Apples because they are in-house, but the Spotify's and the others, everyone has their own different unique strategy. And that actually makes me think about how obviously you've adapted, but also the music industry as well. And one of the things that I know that you've tweeted about often, we've talked about is record labels and how they have also continued to adapt. And I think there's a lot of people that are expecting record labels to have this end or have this point where they are no longer relevant given the rise of indies and all this stuff. But I think both you and I agree that record labels aren't necessarily going to go anywhere. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about why you think that is and why you think that they'll still be here for some time. Yeah, so obviously it goes without saying that because the the barriers to entry have been significantly lowered over the past half decade, it has it is undoubtedly allowed the independent and DIY artist community to, to take some market share away from the major labels. And so their position has been lessened. That, that is, is a, um, an objective opinion based strictly on looking at the numbers. Subjectively, if I were to look ahead and try to forecast what the next five to 10 years look like, their market share, just based on the trend lines, will continue to weaken. They know that though, the major label system um, they were saved by streaming um, and they, they understand their position in the ecosystem right now. As a result, they're going to fight tooth and nail to ensure their, their survival. And so what does that look like exactly? I, I think what you're going to see is, is likely signing more artists than they currently are. And so the budgets that they're currently earmarking for a and R um, and development is going to increase. Essentially, let's let's buy more lottery tickets and, and hope we can cash a few winners. Um, what people need to recognize, artists in particular, the major record labels are in the business of making stars. That is their selling point. And so, if you are an artist and being a a, uh, a middle-class creator is not good enough for you, meaning you can be successful through your music without having to work a secondary job. For some, that's the dream. For for actually, let me take that back. For many, I know that is the dream. Wake up every day and know that music is paying the bills. But there is a significant segment of the creator landscape who who have larger aspirations. And for them, they need a machine behind them because in order to get everything done, you need to be flush with cash. And outside of an external investment, and you'd still then have to find the people and pay them all. And if you're doing all of that, that's less time that you're spending creating. um, You're going to need a system in place. And the labels have that system. And so if you can build up the right leverage and sign a deal that makes sense for you. If you want to become a star, that is your path forward. It's your path forward. It was, it was your path forward 30 years ago. It's your path forward 20 years ago. It's your path forward now. And it'll most likely be your path forward 10 years from now. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think one of the things that you mentioned, it makes me think about is like the ability to become a star 
without a major label is clearly this like gradual slope that has grown over time where it was impossible decades ago. It's a little bit more possible now. But one of the things I think about often is, okay, what is the peak? What is the maximum that an unsigned, truly independent artist can get in today's landscape? And my gut still tells me that if you wanted to become Travis Scott and do everything that he's done in the past four years that he's risen to the heights that he has, I don't know if you can do everything he's done without a major record label, but what is that peak? Like, where is the point that he would have gotten to? Is there a comp? And I know that Chance the Rapper or Russ are the examples that we have, but are there others? I guess, like, what do you think about that? Do you think there is a peak in terms of how far the indie artists can go in today's landscape? Yeah, there, there is a glass ceiling. Um, I, and again, it, it's, it, it's hard to give umbrella answers because each artist is, is, there, is a special case. And so whenever I get these questions on social media, either on the timeline or on, through a DM or, or via email, artists are looking for you know, these like blueprint answers. And I'm reluctant to give them generalized uh, recommendations based on the fact that no two artists are the same. No two artists make the exact same music. No two artists are the same age. No two artists have the same appetite for patience. You, you mentioned a few artists, right? You have Russ, you have Chance the Rapper. Uh, Russ, incredible success story. Um, independently before doing a great deal with Columbia and then leaving Columbia and still being successful independently. But Russ had to be an independent artist for seven years before he got the opportunity to build up the type of leverage he needed to do a favorable partnership deal that allowed him to maintain ownership over all of his catalog leading up to the deal. And then post deal, like step right back into the place he was pre deal, but with the increased fandom that he got through marketing from Columbia. Um, Chance also has always been independent. People laugh when whenever he says he says that because he, he did a deal with Apple. It was a one off deal. He maintained complete ownership over his work. They, they paid him for the exclusive right. But Chance also required um, massive funding, which he got from third parties. Um, I don't know what the splits look like, but to get to that level, you, you need financial support. Um, you just do. You're not going to show up on Saturday Night Live and you're not going to be in Cheetos commercials with the Backstreet Boys and get all of these opportunities as a completely independent artist if you're not getting bankrolled through some party, entity, label, something to get you to that point. Travis Scott is not doing McDonald's uh, partnerships and, and PlayStation partnerships and showing up in video games if he's not at the point in his career where he's benefited from the major label relationships and money. That's just, it's not happening. Um, and, you know, artists don't like hearing that because no one wants their dream bubble popped. But like, you know, you referenced my Twitter earlier. I like to be honest with artists because it, it's hard. Like this, this whole industry is fucking hard. And I, I'd rather tell them the God's honest truth and have them adjust their expectations accordingly than operate, you know, with their head in the sand and, and then be disappointed. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. It reminds me of um, a conversation I had recently with um, Jay Irving, who headed up Human Resources. And I think a lot of people saw him as like an independent label champion. He had artists that wanted to go on that path as well with him. But I think he realized the limitations of how far he could get. And he's like, hey, my artist, and I want them to be able to have that global exposure. When they drop, I want their music to ring out in Tokyo. I want them to get the exposure here. And I had limitations doing that at the Orchard, regardless of my connections and my status and all of that. And that's the reality. I know people had mixed responses about that, but I'm like, what do you want him to do? Like he has some of the artists on his roster that have the ability to pop and become some of the people we just mentioned. And that happens when he has those opportunities. And I think we've seen a bunch of those deals happen. I think we'll see even more of them happen as they continue. And it goes back to um, something else that you had talked mentioned earlier, which is leverage, right? 
Russ was able to build up that leverage because he took time. I know labels came to him much earlier, but he's like, no, I want to get to this point. And if you're willing to wait there, I think it works out well. So yeah, whether you are someone like a Jay Irving leading an indie label, or you are the independent artist, the best time to sign that deal is when you have that leverage so you can make it on your terms and hopefully something that is truly mutually exclusive. Yeah. And, you know, Dan, let's, let's take a second to actually, you know, help your listeners and your viewers and, and, and everybody watching and listening better understand what that actually entails. Right. And so a, a, a label wants to see a proven track record that you can generate money. And so that's not just, you know, you're able to do X number of streams per month on DSPs. It's, do you have the ability to move merch? Do you have the ability to, to get people to buy tickets to see you in concert and, and, and sell out a, a 500 cap room, a, a thousand cap room, a 1500 person cap room? Russ was selling out venues of significant stature and doing, you know, uh, millions of, of unique listeners a month before he decided, you know what, I want to see what Columbia can offer me. And so if he had gone to them earlier, he would have had less leverage. And so obviously an artist thinks to themselves, well, this number of fans every month, is, is that good enough? And if you're considering signing with a label and you have the app appetite to wait and you, you feel like you're making steps toward gaining fans and not losing them, you, I recommend wait. Like all, 100 times out of 100, wait. If you're, if you're young, especially, wait. If you're older though, and you feel like, you know, and this is God's honest truth, labels tell me all the time, it, it, artists who are under 25 years old are just less attractive to them. They feel like the clock's ticking. This is not to say that all A&Rs operate this way. Freddie Gibbs just did a damn partnership with Warner last year and he's pushing 40, right? right. So it, it's not to say that it's impossible, but a lot of labels, they, they wanna get you between 16 and 25. They feel like they know it's going to take years to develop you. And if you if they start later, it's just going to push the whole process back. Um, but yeah, again, when it comes to leverage, if you have an appetite to wait and put yourself in a better position so that you sign a deal with better terms, if that's what you want to do, that's the best path, the best right. path. Yeah, for sure. And I wonder how much of this may change in the era of TikTok. Because obviously, you mentioned earlier, labels are trying to take more at bats. They want to try to get more artists up. And I've seen the stat that TikTok had had in their report. They signed 70 artists that came from TikTok. And if I'm looking at the stats, I think it was a few years ago, they counted all of the artists signed to major labels in a year. It was around 700 or so. So I'm like, okay, a tenth? And who knows? I feel like given the impact and the trajectory of uh, TikTok, that number is only going to increase over time. And how many artists are going to be, you know, still having that patience mentality when it seems like things are just kind of boom, boom, how many, you know, what's kind of traction do you have on TikTok and so on? Well, I think there's two things to keep in mind there. So first, over the last year plus now, uh, the music industry has had to uh, shift the way that they do a and r as a result of the pandemic and so we're going to find out later this year and next uh that that number the number of artists signed uh, that were discovered on tiktok is going to be way, way higher and it's simply because labels aren't flying artists out to see them they're not in the office they haven't been in, in their offices since last march they're not flying out to go see artists so tiktok is a breeding ground right now for artist discovery from a, a signing perspective. Um, I think the fear that I have there is most TikTok signings are, are lightning in a bottle. And it's very, it's very difficult for me to see that lightning strike twice. And so you're going to have a lot of artists who are completely underbaked, young, naive, very little guidance, little to no understanding of, of the industry, signing uh, album deals, multiple album deals, when, when the concept of creating an album is not even something that they've considered. So, um, you know, and, and if you're a moment artist, I would define a moment artist by saying like an artist who's comfortable pursuing a career based on a particular sound or style in a moment, and they don't have long-term aspirations, by all means, <laughs> uh, if you can get the bag, 
and this, you're just in it for to be cool for the time being, go for it. Um, but if you see yourself as a long-term career artist, someone who wants to be doing music professionally forever, someone who doesn't ever have to work a non-music job, someone who wants to be able to tour off of their music for decades, then that is definitely not a sound strategy as far as entrance into this game. And this isn't the first time that we've seen this either, right? It reminds me in some ways of when ringtones first came up. There were plenty of rappers and groups we know that were known for that era. So that was their same moment. Some of them continued to adapt and became people that are very respected in the game. But a lot of them we have not heard since someone had them as a ringtone on their phone. And I think we're going to see the same thing play out with TikTok here. Some people are going to be here for this TikTok moment and even though TikTok itself may be here for a while, we're talking more about the immediate phase in the culture, especially like this particular interest peak that it's had, especially given the pandemic. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, and just to clarify, Dan, for our, our, our listeners here, TikTok is an incredible uh, resource that you should absolutely be using for the purpose of, of fan building and engaging with those fans. It affords you the opportunity to create micro content on a recurring basis that doesn't cost you anything. And so, you know, me saying be wary of building up a, a following and then that being your ticket into the game is completely separate from utilizing TikTok as a tool, as a resource for development of a fan base, which is necessary when you get into any of these conversations with. Uh, labels or investors. They want to see that, that, that you have people who are committed to you beyond um, a retweet or a like, people who are in, invested in your music and not your personality on their timeline. Yeah, it's, it's clearly impactful. I think it's more about how you use these things. And I think this is true for all platforms, whether it's another social media or how you go about putting out your music or how you're releasing things or how you're trying to gain momentum and truly build your audience. And I'm sure you get hit up quite a bit, people asking you for advice on how they're going about things or people that are doing different things. You're seeing things that make sense. You're seeing things that don't make sense. What are some common mistakes that you're seeing that artists often make in today's era? They're all a product of impatience. So artists just, they love jumping the line. You know, they see others who they feel like they're more talented than, and they think to themselves, I make better music. I have a better vocal. I can rap better. I'm, I'm more attractive. I have, I have a stronger following. And in an effort to jump the line, try to get ahead of, of, of their, their peers, their creator peers, they foolishly pay for fake engagement and they pay for fake followers and they pay to be added to playlists and run the risk of being deplatformed um, from these services. And, and they pay for fake plays. And so, you know, ultimately you're just playing yourself because all of these are vanity metrics, which let's be honest, do play a, a significant role in perception, but when it comes time to actually get things done, so hire a booking agent and get booked for shows, uh, sign a deal if that's what you're, you're interested in, there are plenty of resources that we all have to determine whether or not all of these numbers are real or bullshit. Um, on AudioMath, we catch, um, fraudulent juicers who pay for third party, you know, boost packages all the time. And those artists are punished. Um, and so, you know, it's not worth it. Uh, instead of worrying about other creators, what you should worry about is how can I make music and create a narrative around that music that is interesting and entertaining enough to get people to take time out of their day to invest in me. That is their, that should be their primary focus. Um, put blinders on, ignore what other artists are doing. And remember that what you're up against is consumer free time, not singer X and rapper Y. 
That makes sense. And you had mentioned this earlier about fake streams or things that you can catch through the audio Mac platform. So what does that look like specifically? Like, what are you seeing from a data perspective that signals that someone is doing something that they shouldn't be doing? That's a great question. So we're able to determine where plays are coming from. So that's broken down into several boxes, right? So plays could be coming natively through the app. They could be coming natively through the desktop or mobile website. They could come through a third party embed. So if a website or blog embeds the audio Mac player, and then within the artist creator dashboard, you can see where the streams are coming from on a more granular level. For instance, um, are they coming from a user library? Are they coming through search? Are they coming through a playlist ad? Are they coming through the trending section? Or are they coming through the final category, other? <laughs> other is essentially um, artificial. Uh, and so these are manipulated plays. Um, these are plays that don't reach the 30 second threshold. So automatically they, they raise an eyebrow based on the length of time. Uh, and then you can track how many of them are coming from the same IP address over a period of time. It, like, it doesn't take a, a, a CSI guy to, to figure out like that, that if I put these numbers in front of anybody, they go you know, yeah, legit, 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 up, oh, faker, legit, 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 faker. So, I mean, you know, again, artists are just playing themselves. It's, it's obvious to anyone who, who knows what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think the fake streams and the farms, like so many people hear about this and it seems like something that should be so obvious, but any game, especially online where there is some type of metric where vanity is involved and people can ha gain more status by having things or get clout it's there whether it's yeah social media followers and all those things and i'm sure some of those things can be easy but like i know that every stage of this industry has had its level of fraud even in the days of people buying cds like there were always issues but it was like okay how can you minimize this so that you could either point out what isn't there or it becomes so much of a small factor that it doesn't change the narrative on the discussion that much yeah yeah, and, and you know, for, for the sake of, of both sizing, both siding this argument or this conversation, uh, the, the major label system, the labels, they're just as guilty. You referenced the CD era. Labels used to just buy the, the CDs back in bulk and then give them away. Uh, right. Some of them were even caught uh, and, and fined heavily for it. Um, and there have been several articles published in, in uh, I believe, Rolling Stone that showcase the 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 volume of, of uh, or the vastness, I should say, of these, these pay for play third party companies that the label systems are employing. Um, but to the independent artist community, if you're, if, if you're listening, I would say this, just because the major label system has done it and apparently is continuing to do it is, should not be the reason why you should do it uh, because you're just cheating yourself. Like there's a, there's a difference between a, a giant corporation possibly engaging in some shady underhanded tactics for, for the purpose of, of boosting up some of their developing acts versus you, lone independent artists with very little to no money to invest in your career, spending that very little to no money in this way. Um, if, you, if you have tight purse strings, that those finances would be far better off being uh, repurposed in a more significant and meaningful way than paying for for bullshit. Right. And there's also a brand and uh, reputation difference too. All the major labels can be known for some of the things that they may do. But at the end of the day, there are enough positive proof points that still make them attractive partners for people. You as an independent artist, a lot of people don't know you. So that's the first impression that they might have that becomes the impression of you. No one's going to have that impression overall. Well, some people might have a Universal or Warner, but there's so many other imprint or impressions that it's not going to overpower it, but it could be very damaging for you as the indie artist. I agree, 100%. And, and ultimately, th this entire industry, uh, it, it's your, your reputation precedes you. Um, you know, I, I, I've talked to folks on the outside who think that the music industry and the 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 
overlapping industries that revolve around it are, are huge. They're really not. It's a relatively small business in particular as it pertains to the people who, who um, are, are in power. You know, everybody knows everybody almost directly, if not through one person. This is not a six degrees of Kevin Bacon situation. And so, you know, every decision that you make, especially in the era of social media, will follow you um, or will be dug back up and you'll be reminded of it. So if at any point in your career, you're caught for paying for playlisting, uh, buying fake followers or fans, uh, whatever word you want to use, uh, buying plays or boosting plays, if that is made public, it's impossible to scrub that from the internet. So, you know, buyer beware. Right. Well, I think on the flip side of this, you've clearly seen artists that have done things the right way that are doing things well. And I know each week you at Audio Mac World, you're highlighting, hey, these are the artists to check out. And I'm sure some of the, these artists have impressed you by the good things they've done, how they've been able to grow and develop and the things they've done. Who are some of those artists that stick out and what are some of the things that they've done? Well, I, I want to start off with one artist who actually doesn't have any material uh, on Audio Mac, but who I'm thoroughly impressed with in terms of their business model. And that's Rock Marciano. So Rock Marciano is a veteran rapper and he has developed this very core loyal fan base who expects to pay him for his music, which he windows to his website and to Bandcamp. And as a result, He's done very, very well for himself while also making the music available for stream, just not at the same time as the initial release. Um, you know, he's done hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue through um, bundles where he'll take the digital download and put it with some piece of tangible merchandise. Um, and ultimately, people are not listening to music today, at least. Um, through the digital download. It's not even about the digital download. It's about people having the opportunity to show their love and appreciation for an artist whose music they respect. When people are, are buying the digital download, they're just, it's their, it's their way of saying thank you. They're not actually taking the damn MP3s and sticking it on their phone. Like the rest of us, they're waiting for it to be available on their streaming service of choice so they can stream it easily. Um, by the way, Apple AirPod Pros, they absolutely suck. They do not stay in your ears. I, I hate them. Um, Apple, if you're listening, I want my money back. Um, <laughs> yeah, so love what Rock Marciano is doing. Um, there's an artist from Chicago, Toby Liu. I love what he's doing. He's, uh, he, he did a great deal with Empire. Uh, he has continually released quality music in these like, uh, I mean, you call them EPs, but they're, they're like a single bursts packs of two and three records at a time. Um, he, he never um, trips himself up by releasing too much too quickly. He always creates um, a visual narrative. It doesn't have to be a music video, usually is, to accompany the work, which takes it to the next level. Uh, the marketing, the branding, the illustration, um, everything spot on. And artists like Toby, who understand that it's not just about the music, it's everything. It's, it's your profile photo, it's your press photos, it's your website, um, it's, it's, it's micro content that accompanies the release on social media. It, all of this is, is, is important. It can't just be, hey, music's available on Audio Mac and Tidal and Apple and Spotify. You need to be able to create a secondary element using digital marketing tactics to pull people into your world. They'll appreciate the music even more if they already know you. And if they don't know you and they just discovered you, then, I mean, it, what, what a ticket into your world. Yeah, I feel like that Toby Lou piece especially, especially is key because you have someone that is really trying to make each release that they have a virtual or digital event like create excitement about this, have something. And it doesn't need to be this big album drop. Like, the fact that he's doing the two or the three packs, not, you know, not too different than what Drake has kind of been doing with these like scary hour things, make that the thing. And I think in some ways I've kind of been waiting for this because you've seen music adapt to its medium or whatever the trend is for some time. And whether it's 
back when they had vinyls or cassettes and then CDs, things have clearly adapted. And I think you've seen some things in streaming where there's been like little things like, okay, the song titles are shorter because it's easier to search for those if you're, you know, on the go. Or the songs themselves are shorter because everyone is trying to get, you know, closer to that minimum 30 second or whatever it is. There's no reason to have the four verses and, you know, all of those things. But I do think that these packs may become more the wave. I and mean, you just saw the success that Drake did. And sometimes, yeah, you may need the superstar to really do the same thing that the smaller rising artists have been doing. But I'm curious if we'll see more of those because there's clearly an effective way to do that. And it's a way to just be like, boom, boom, boom. And having a consistent presence, but a identifiable scene out without this long buildup and the work that's involved with making, you know, these concept albums that can take a lot of, can take a lot more time. I love the, uh, the EPs um, uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, you know, when you're young and you have more free time uh, to invest into on-demand content, that's one thing. But when you're older, I turned 37 in April, I have a four-year-old and I work like 60, 65 hours a week. Um, now, granted, I'm fortunate because listening to music is literally part of my job. Uh, but for those who don't have that benefit, time is never going to be on your side. And so the shorter projects, I mean, they're helpful because you can get in and get out and then get it back in and get out and not be overwhelmed just by looking at the track listing, which oftentimes is what happens when you notice that the runtime for an album is like an hour and 17 minutes and it's 26 tracks. And you think to yourself, I don't even know how I'm going to carve out time to make it through half of this project. Um, you're right. I don't think any artist not named Drake should expect to release a three song pack and debut at one, two, and three on the billboard. That is just definitely not realistic. Um, that said, I'm of the mindset as if you're an independent artist, if you are a DIY or developing artist, even if you're a newly signed artist, but still considered as, as an emerging talent, I would be all in on only releasing singles and short projects, three to five songs max. The expectation that someone who is not familiar with you is gonna stick around for 45 minutes and longer, slim to none. We live in a playlist generation. And so if someone hears something that they like, they might give you a chance, but if, that chance requires them to commit to an hour, that's probably a good 40 plus minutes longer than they're interested in giving you. And so the shorter projects, definitely better. And a fun fact for everyone out there, the reason why um, artists are doing this is because to get paid on a stream, the listener needs to at least commit to 30 seconds. So if they clock out under 30 seconds, it still counts as a play to the, to the rest of the world, but it's not a monetized play. So no one's actually getting any money off of that play. So something to consider obviously in the creation is are people gonna sit through this? And if, they, if I'm not hooking them immediately, not only am I losing them from continuing to listen, but I'm not even generating any money from them. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that if you want to be able to have the valuable audience that's there, you need to adapt. And I think you've seen this happen across media as well. Like there's still a place for, you know, your big, long movies, but a lot of these studios have still invested in shorter form. That's why people have these eight part, 30 minute documentaries and the same studio will still have, you know, the two and a half hour long thing. And well, in this days, it's probably still going to go straight to video, but still it just shows that, okay, there's a way to build and engage this base so that when the big thing comes, there is a following there. And I think the, and I think this is where sometimes people may get lost because I think there's still a valuable place to have those like deep, those concept albums that class, those classic albums. And anyone that's listening to this can see behind you, Z, you got a whole bunch of classic albums behind you that just resonate. And I think that, you know, cause I've had this conversation with so many people, it's like, oh, are, are we going to move away from classics? Are we moving away from that? And I think the answer is 
Well, not necessarily. I understand why, because the medium has changed and people don't necessarily need to put out these things. So I think it's going to become very rare for someone's first release to be like an Illmatic or the same way it was with Nas. But that said, you can continue to put in that work and maybe it looks different over time. But when you do put it out, it does have a chance to be on a wall like that. Yeah. And, and also fun fact, uh, outside of New York, uh, the rest of the country absolutely shit on Illmatic. Uh, the reviews for that album were not favorable outside of the East Coast, uh, which just goes to show that as much as things have changed over the past 30 years, so much has stayed the same. It's really impossible to gauge whether or not a, a particular title will stand the test of time. You just have to be patient. Um, I mean, the way behaviorally that we are consuming media is what has fundamentally changed the way that artists are making music. And so I don't, I don't see us being able to put the cap back on that bottle. I mean, we just talked about having to consider streaming service consumer behavior as it pertains to length of track and length of project. Um, ultimately what this is about is not every artist should feel required to be an album artist. It takes a special talent to craft a cohesive body of work, whether it's a concept project or not. And, you know, fundamentally, for as long as I, the industry has existed, artists have been signed primarily to multi album deals, but many artists don't have an album in them. And there's nothing wrong with being a singles artist. But for some reason in today's society, if that's all you are, like you, you, you can hit the billboard charts with a record, but then when it comes time to releasing a project, it's, it's sort of a dud. Like we should normalize that and not say like, that artist is a failure. And that's the perception on social media is if your first week numbers are poor, then you are a failure. Well, no, that's not true at all. You just might be better at capturing attention in bursts and not crafting this 14 track odyssey. Um, yeah, we need to change this. We need to. Right. There are so many ways to become successful in this industry. There are so many ways to do this. And now more than ever, because there is this full package, I think the more that we change the narrative and I think it's, you know, hip hop as a culture and the fans as a culture having these age old things that they hold on to. It's like, okay, there can be success beyond that. Let's expand that. And I think there's yep. a good opportunity to do that. I agree. I agree. And it just, it's, it's going to take time. I know uh, everybody just likes to be really loud on social media about everything that they're unhappy with. Um, you know, artists aren't happy with uh, the payouts on streaming services and, um, you know, every, everybody has something to complain about is my point. And so everybody just needs to take a deep breath. They need to understand that we're still very early, like we said in this conversation at the beginning, in the streaming era. Things are going to change. Things are going to improve. The pendulum is going to shift. Artists will be, will be even more empowered. Um, and hopefully at that point in time, they'll have to take less consideration for um, consumer behavior and, and worry just about the art. Um, uh, and, and, and maybe maybe then the consumers will be happier because they'll be able to enjoy a better, uh, higher quality product that's less manufactured. Right, agreed. So last question before we tie things up, you talked a little bit there about how, yes, we're still in the early stages of streaming and this obviously is part of the shift. What do you think those next phases are going to look like? Obviously, as someone that is working in this industry, you probably have some foresight into where you think this is going. Where do you think things are going? And how do you see Audio Mac and DJ Booth adapting with that? I think the future of the streaming industry from a tech side is incorporating social media, messaging, uh, editorial, uh, video, and audio all into one space. Uh, make it so that knowing the consumer typically is going to be uh, grabbed and pulled in a variety of directions that at, at present would, would largely require them to have to toggle between a variety of apps, but being able to do all of that in one, in one space, seamlessly and harmoniously uh, and enjoyably. Um, I think 
we need to also focus on bringing the creator even closer to their fans, uh, helping to bridge that gap. So they're making a more meaningful and significant connection that hopefully for the artist's sake will allow them to feel that support beyond just, hey, I, I streamed their album the day that it came out. Uh, as far as music journalism is concerned, I'm, I'm not truly as optimistic overall, um, but we're doing our part at Audio Mac by, uh, by creating and uh, relaunching and focusing in on discovery and editorial um, through world, utilizing the resources that the DJ booth can provide as a, as a legacy veteran platform in this space. Um, I know that a lot of the conversation, Dan, that we've had here today has been um, bordering on doom and gloom, but I'm very optimistic about the future, not only of obviously both of my companies, but about the industry at large. I think um, uh, independent artists in particular have never been able to exist at a better time in recorded music history. There are a bounty of resources at their disposal and a uh, proliferation of educational tools and uh, opportunities at their fingertips. And so now is the time um, and it'll only get better. Well said, well said, couldn't agree more. All right, Z, so before we let you go, where can the audience follow you? And is there anything else that you'd like to plug or let them know about? Sure, you can uh, follow me on the only social media app that I have an account on, which is Twitter. I am at DJ Booth EIC. Um, I got rid of my Instagram years ago and I deactivated uh, Facebook, so sorry. Um, Dan, thank you so much for having me on. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, but, and Apple, if you're still listening, these, these pros suck. They are not staying in my ears. I could not be more thoroughly unimpressed with this product, especially at such a high price point. I just want to make that very clear to Apple. Very disappointed. I'm gonna have to put this in the show notes now, the Apple podcast show notes specifically to make sure they see it. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> Will do. All right, Z, we'll talk soon, man. This was great. Sounds good, Dan.